Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, good morning. How is everybody? Good. Well, I'm Joel. I'm a teaching guy here. And uh, two quick things before we get started. First, it is Pastor Appreciation Month. I guess it's the Pastor, Pastor Appreciation Day. And we were going to honor our pastors, but they're actually in the back teaching a class. <laughs> so let's all give an applause for our pastors who aren't here. Yeah. All right. Our senior pastor, Marcus and Natalie Avalos, always serving, always doing what they can for this church. And they're actually in the back teaching our new members class, which we have a lot of new members. So they are taking that. And, uh, but man, they have done an amazing job at this church. You know, they have planted seeds in this community for Man, lots and lots of years. And if you plant seeds long enough and stick around, you can be confident that God is going to bring a harvest. And we're starting to see that here at the church. So a lot of you are a part of that. You've seen the amazing things that God has done through this church. And we are so glad that you're here. If you're new to the place, welcome. We're so glad you're here. It's a great, exciting time to be part of the growth here. We've got lots of ways you can get involved. So I'd encourage you to do that. One of the ways we can get involved is we actually have a men's conference coming up November 1st and 2nd. It's actually going to be a little bit different this year. We're actually going to hold it right here in this building. So you don't have to go off and uh, sleep away from your own bed, which a lot of guys don't like, I know. So uh, you can actually come here. We're going to have that November 1st and 2nd. And we're going to talk about some stuff that, man, there's some stuff guys uniquely deal with that we need to deal with. And so we're going to talk about those things. We won't make it awkward or anything, make you strip off your shirt and run around with a sword or anything. Um, (laughs) some weird conferences that do that stuff. We don't do that here, but we are going to talk about some stuff that's really important for men because listen to me, societies rise and fall on the strength of their men, specifically on the strength of their godly men, right? And we have a a, a world right now that's kind of downplayed the importance of men and, and true, honest, godly masculinity. And we need men who are strong because when man, when men are strong, man, When men take their right place and women take their right place, God honors that and a society rises. So we're going to talk about that November 1st and 2nd. You can sign up. Uh, We have some information in the back, but you can sign up on the app for that. Y'all ready for this? We're going to be talking, uh, continuing our series, Live Wise, where we're going through the book of Proverbs, talking about the importance of living with wisdom. And speaking of men's conferences, a few years ago, I got asked, uh, you know, you guys know I, I speak at a lot of outside events from here. So about half the year I'm here, and then about the other half of the year I'm out speaking at events. I got asked to speak at a men's event a few years ago up in North Texas. It was a big men's event, and when I, when I pulled up, I was like, wow, there are a lot of men here, and they had paid big money to show up at this men's conference. I was like, this is going to be exciting talking to guys. But when I got the schedule, they said, hey, welcome. We're so glad you're here. They gave me the schedule, and I was on the first night— and there were four people, no, there were five people, excuse me, speaking before me. I was like, what in the world? And they're like, don't worry, uh, they're all only going to speak 20 minutes. And I was like, 20, and I, but I saw before their names, it said pastor so-and-so. And I'm like, okay, I'm a pastor's kid. I know when you tell a pastor to speak 20 minutes, it's going to be an hour at least, right? So I was like doing the math and I'm like, wait a second, if we start at six, holy cow, I'm not going to go on till like 930 and I'm usually in bed by 930. So I had a real problem because I was like, I'm already starting to get tired. My energy is starting to wane. And here I'm supposed to come up and give this talk to these men. So I'm like, all right, here we go. I'm going to keep a good attitude, you know. So I'm sitting there listening to all these guys that get up before me. And there's a bunch of men out there. And every one of the speakers that got up before me, this was the essence of their message. Stop sinning, you dirty, rotten men. Stop sinning. Stop looking at porn. Stop. Just stop it. Stop sinning. And all these guys are like, yeah, 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 okay. Let's stop, let's stop. And they had an altar call. There's like four altar calls before I got up there. An altar call, if you're new to the church, this is where you call people up and they repent of their sins and drop to their knees. We do it a little bit different here. So all these guys, by the time I had gotten up and spoken, they had been told to stop sinning multiple times. They'd all come up and confess their sins and drop to their knees multiple times. And then I get up there, I'm like, doop, doop. <laughs> the thing is, I'm thinking the whole time, I think these guys want to stop sinning. That's why they're here, right? Like, you don't pay money to go to a conference if you don't have the desire. It's kind of like you if you're showing up at church here. I'm guessing everybody here wants to stop sinning. Is that that accurate? Raise your hand if you want to stop sinning. Okay, the rest of you, we need to have an altar call. (laughs) I'm just kidding. We want to stop sinning. And listen, trust me in this. Okay, like... I want to stop sinning. And I've been walking in this faith for like 40 something years. But have you noticed it's really hard to stop sinning? Like there's this thing you do, like we've all got at least one or two things and we just always go back to it. 
And afterwards you go, oh, why did I do that again? Why did I do that again? One of the most encouraging passages in the Bible is where Paul, the guy that wrote like a bunch of the New Testament, he says this, he says, guys, I don't get it. I don't do the stuff I want to do and I do the stuff I don't want to do. Who's going to deliver me from this? Because it's sin at work in me. And we have this constant struggle. And listen, I've been walking in the faith for over 40 years. And I'm telling you, man, it's still like every, I don't know, maybe every three or four weeks, I still sin at least once. It's a joke. <laughs> I struggle with it all the time. And I know this about everybody in this room. You've got something you constantly go back to. And you go, oh, I'm doing it again. Maybe it's hitting that substance. And you go, why do I always feel the need to go back to that? I thought I had this beat. Or maybe you just fall into anger and you turn into this rage with your kids. And you're like, why do I? And then you look at them and you see them sweetly sleeping at night. And you go, oh. Why did I get so mad at them? They're so sweet. I love them so much. But yet, an hour earlier, you wanted to kill them. <laughs> I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. Right? <laughs> or maybe there's stuff you just kind of constantly find yourself as you're scrolling through. You find yourself going down this rabbit hole and looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at. Maybe it's pornography or just bad things. And you go, man, why can't I beat this? I always fall back into this. So... I got up in front of all those men who had been hearing, stop, stop sinning. And you know what I told them? I said, you guys keep on sinning. I'm just kidding. That's not what I said at all. <laughs> I would never say that. Here's what I told them. I told them what I'm going to tell you guys this morning. You will never conquer habitual ingrained sin through an act of willpower alone. Ever. You don't have the willpower. You don't have the discipline. I'm a fairly disciplined person but I can't do it. I try as hard as I can, and I just still can't beat some things that I've been trying to conquer. And I'll have victory for a while, but I'll fall back into it. But here's the good news. Listen to me. This is super important. When you accept the gift of what Jesus did on the cross, he forgives your sins once and for all. He forgives everything you did in the past, no matter how bad it was. He forgives everything you did this morning. It's done. He doesn't, in fact, check this out. God doesn't even think about your sin anymore if you're in Christ. If you've accepted the gift of Christ, God does not think about your sin. And some of you go, whoa, wait a second, huh? You think about your sin all the time because you're constantly dealing with it. God doesn't even think about it. In fact, there's multiple verses. There's this one verse that says, he throws your sin as far as the east is from the west. There's another verse that says, I'm just gonna choose to not remember it anymore. You go, but God, God, he's like, no. When I look at you, I don't see your sin if you've accepted Christ. All I see is the perfection of Jesus Christ on you. Because Jesus did for you what you could never do for yourself. You could never be good enough. I had a friend one time at work. I was talking to her and she's like, well, I just hope when I get up before the pearly gates that my good works outweigh my bad works. And I said to her, I said, well, let me ask you a question. Like, do you think I'm a pretty good person? She's like, oh yeah, you're way better than me. And I was like, well, what if I'm the minimum standard for getting in? You're screwed. <laughs> and she was like, oh, well, like that's the thing. It has nothing to do with levels of goodness. It has everything to do with Jesus taking the price you could not pay. And he paid for it once and for all. But, but, but here's the challenge. We still mess up day to day and God doesn't think about it, but you do. And this is why conquering sin is so important. We don't conquer sin to make God approve of us more because he's already approving of you as more. He can't approve of you more than he does right now because he approves of Jesus Christ inside of you. If you can wrap your mind around that, that changes everything. But the reason we fight and try to conquer sin is because sin weakens us. Okay? It says in Romans, it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What that means is God intended you for glory. But when we sin, it actually weakens us and compromises us. And it makes us not live up to the glory that God says is already within us. He says, man, I see the righteousness of Christ in you. I see the perfection of Jesus. Live up to that. And that's our job every day is to live up to what we're called to be. He says, you're already in Christ. Like you're as good in terms of goodness as, as you can possibly be in my eyes. Now live up to that. But we have this challenge because we don't live up to it. And we feel compromised. And you know, sin makes you feel weak. 
When you lie and you walk away, you're going, oh, why didn't I just tell the truth about that? Now I got to cover for it. And you feel a little bit weaker. Men, when you look at that stuff online, and you're like, oh, and then you go see your kids and your wife and you just kind of feel dirty and you're like, oh, I'm not the man I should be. And you feel this guilt and this shame. Maybe you, you manipulate a situation and you know you manipulated it. And afterwards you're like, oh, why did I feel like I needed to do that? It was, I guess it was to protect myself. And you feel guilty about it. And we carry this weight and it compromises us and it causes us to live far short of the glory God intended for us because sin weakens us. And that's why we fight sin. We don't fight sin to get approval from God. We've already got that. We fight sin because we're called to live a life of glory, walking in this glory. And the only way you're going to do that is living up to what God has called you to live up to. And that is what the journey is that we're in. This is this battle in. But here's the thing. You're never going to win these, this battle against sin by willpower alone because you don't have the strength on your own. It has to be a work of God's spirit in you. And that sounds super ethereal, but I'm going to try and unpack what that means today based on my own personal experience, okay? So we're looking at, we're looking at the book of, uh, of Proverbs, and we're looking at some of the Proverbs of King Solomon. King Solomon says this. He says, guys, if you want to live with wisdom, here's what you've got to do. And we're going to look at this verse today. There's this story uh, about these, these two guys, and they're camping by a river, and they hear this kid screaming. He's like, help, help. And he's getting washed down the river in these rapids. And so both the guys, they jump in the river and they go to rescue the kid and they pull him out. And he's like, <sighs> and they're like, are you okay? And they're like trying to comfort him. And they, they hear behind them another scream. And there's another kid getting washed down the river. So the guys both jump in and they go and rescue to swim, swim and rescue the kid. And they pull him out. And they've got these two kids. And they're like, are you guys okay? And about that time, they hear a little girl getting washed down the river. She's like, help, help. The one guy jumps back in the river and goes and swims to rescue her. And the other guy, he starts running upstream. And the guy in the river's like, dude, where are you going? And he goes, I'm going up the stream to see who keeps throwing these kids in the river. <laughs> and in our lives... There comes a time where sometimes we've got to just stop being in survival and rescue mode for ourselves. And we've got to figure out what's causing me to constantly get in this situation where I want this stuff that's bad for me. And you got to go upstream and look and go, what, what's the root of this? And listen, the root of it is sin, but there's all sorts of things because this is the challenge with sin. Sin is so all-encompassing. What sin did to the world, making us fall short of the glory of God, is so all-encompassing. It impacts us in areas we don't even realize. There's this verse in, in 1 Timothy 5 where Paul tells Timothy, he says, Some men's sins go before them and are evident. Other men's sins are hidden and come behind them. And that has a lot of meanings to it. But what I think it means is, yeah, there's some sin that's really blatant and we know we're doing it, but there's some things that sin has been so impacting of how we do things that we don't even realize until later how it impacted those around us and it hurt those around us. And you end up going, I had the best of intentions, but why do I have a broken relationship with my kids? My heart was pure. My heart was sincere. And you have to realize that there was poss quite possibly a way that you saw the world, a thought pattern, an action pattern that was so tainted by sin that you didn't even realize until afterwards the effect that it had. You go, why, why does nobody want to hang around with me? Why does everybody kind of push away from me and avoid me? Well, maybe it's because you always had to be right. And you always had to correct everybody. And you were so critical. And you go, was that a sin to be critical? I'm just, I mean, perfection is next. It's godliness, isn't it? But maybe unintentionally, in your pride, you drove other people away. Why can't I keep good employees? I was talking to a business guy the other day. He's like, all my best employees leave. I'm like, well, listen, what's the common denominator between all those best employees and you? He's like, you. Maybe there's something you're doing that you don't realize is un disempowering these people. And it's one of those things you go, well, it's not necessarily a sin, but it's the result of a sin mindset or behavior. A sin was so all-encompassing that we need a total radical transformation of who we are. And this is where Paul says, guys, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You've got to start to see the world in a whole different way. And that is the battle because we have to start to recognize where our thoughts, where our behaviors, where our actions originate. And oftentimes we have to go upstream and get to the root of them, which is what King Solomon's saying is a part of wisdom. When he says this, he says, the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. What's he saying here? He's saying, 
the reason you do things, when you keep going, why do I do this? Why does he do that? There's always something deeper going on beneath the surface of your actions. What you do out here in the world is a result of something you believe, something you feel, or something you want. And he's saying, if you want to be really wise, you got to look past the behavior and try and figure out what's at the root. Of, you have to like go down into this well and go, there's something in this deep well. And you have to scoop up what's below the surface in the well. And a wise person doesn't just look at their actions. They look at what's driving those actions. What's upstream causing this chaos downstream? And he's saying a wise person will take the time to look a little deeper at their actions or to look at the actions of others and say, what could be causing this in someone? And he goes on to say, many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man, who can find? The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Now, what this is talking about here is it's talking about motivation. And this is the really devious thing about motivations. Like, the older I get, the more I'm realizing I can't even trust that my own motives are pure. I want to think my motives are pure, but most of the time there's a little bit of selfish interest involved. And I can tell myself my heart is pure, but if I'm not doing what is godly, and I, even if I don't realize if my motives are pure, I will get the results of what my response to the world causes. And this is where he's saying, he's like, listen, you've got to recognize that in your motives, like you, you may not even know, like you may say you're like a loyal friend, but your actions show more what's in your heart. And you have to be really humble about that. So he goes on, he says this, the righteous who walks in integrity, blessed for his children. Integrity means completeness. Integrity means living on the outside, completely in line with what you have going on on the inside. And integrity means some, disintegrous activity means you, you, you're kind of separated in yourself. And what God's calling you to do is to be a complete and whole in him. But you only get that when you're living in line with what God has put his spirit inside of you, which we're going to talk about in a second. So we go on to say, who can say I've made my heart pure and I am clean from sin? Again, he's talking about motives. He's like, yeah, you think your motives are pure, but we've all been tainted by sin. And you got to be really careful about thinking your motives are pure because even in your purest of motives, you can end up wounding and hurting others. And that's a really humbling thing. And you go, well, sh we're all doomed. Yes, we are apart from Jesus. But thank God, thanks be to God through his grace, he comes and he forgives us and he helps us get our motives and our hearts in line with him. And this is what he says, unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Sometimes we've, we've, we value, this is a fascinating thing too. Sometimes in our motives, we think we're righteous over here and other people are unrighteous. And he's like, eh, trying to value yourself, compare yourself to others, that's an abomination to the Lord. The only person you compare yourself to is God. And we fall short of that, but thanks be to Jesus, we can live to it. And he says this, this is, what, this is a fascinating verse. Even a child makes himself known by his acts, by whether his conduct is pure and upright. You can even see in a child what's going on in their heart. Early on, what's going on inside of you affects what's going on outside of you. So what's that lead to? It leads to this reality what Jesus said. He said, guys, the issue is always in the heart. There's this, there's this moment where the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, why don't your disciples follow all of our rules about what you can and can't do? And Jesus is like, guys, you're looking at the wrong thing. You guys follow all the rules, but your hearts are evil. I know what's in your hearts. And he's like, and then he ups the ante and he says something crazy. He says this, he says, guys, you've said, yeah, if you, look at, or if you have sex with a woman outside of marriage, that's sin. Well, let me up the ante here. If you even look at a woman with a thought of that in your mind, you have sinned. Go, what, what? But we didn't do the deed. He's like, yeah, but if you even thought about it, you've already sinned. You go, ouch. Well, that's hard. What, what that means is every one of us in here, just some of our own thoughts have been sinful enough, even if we didn't act on it. And this is what he says. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. Because what comes out of you is based on what's inside of you. He says, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. That pretty much covers all of us, doesn't it, at some point? All these evils come from inside a person and defile a person. He's saying your problem is that sin thing within you. But thanks be to God, we have 
forgiveness of that. And now we need to walk out of the new person that God made us. And listen, this is really good news because some of you are in environments right now where you're trying to change, but you have all around you negativity and toxicity all around you. And you're going, I can't change until I get out of this, get out of this environment. But for some of you, you can't get out of the environment. Some of you are married to that environment. I mean, not mar- you know what I mean? But here's the good news. This is the good news. Even if you can't get out of the environment, now listen, make no mistake. Sometimes you do need to remove yourself from negative environments for change. Sometimes you need to get away from certain people. But there's sometimes you just can't do that. You have to do it, you know, it's very difficult. But here's the good news. You can change from the inside no matter how bad things are around you. Because transformation always starts inside and it's a work of God within you. And here's what it looks like. All right, here's a really helpful graphic, okay? Now, I wrote a whole book about this and we sold out of them in first service, so I don't have any available. But if you want to go online, there's a U version devotional about it. It's called Fully You. It's a book I wrote. It's an audio book too. You can go online and get that. But this graphic is from that book. This is a simple graphic. A guy named Watchman Nee came up with this. Just like it says in the Bible that, that uh, we're created in the image of God, God is three parts. One of the elements of that One of the elements, it's just a small piece of it, is that we are made of three parts. You are made of three parts. There's your body. That's the part we all see. That's what we interact with the world with. It's your body, right? Then the second part of you is a little bit deeper. It's your soul. And your soul is made up of your thoughts, your desires, and your emotions. Okay? So like if you're feeling something really strongly, it's your soul. And then the third part of you is your spirit. Now, this is, what, this is really important what happens here. The Bible says that before you come to Christ, you're dead in your spirit. It says you're dead in your sin and trespasses. You're just dead inside. Some of y'all know what that feeling is like. But it says when, when you accept the gift of Christ, he comes and he actually puts his own spirit inside of you, which is where the radical transformation happens. He comes and I don't understand how it all works theologically. Anybody that tells you they know how it works theologically is making it up. They don't know. We don't know how it all works. But the bottom line is the spirit of God actually comes and lives inside of you and he starts to change you. But here comes the battle. You've still got a body that has all sorts of stuff that it wants. And the battle comes between what your body wants to do and what the spirit of God in you wants to do. It's like two dogs fighting. I heard a story about a young boy and he came to the chief of his tribe and he said, I've got these two dogs in me that are fighting. One's a white dog and one's a black dog and they're just fighting and fighting and fighting. And he said, which one's going to win, chief? And the chief said, the one that wins will be the one you feed the most. It's the one that'll get strongest. And this is what's happening inside of us. You've got the spirit of God living in you. And listen to me, you can never have more of the spirit of God in you than you have right now. It's already there. You have everything you need, it says in the Bible, for life and godliness. The goal is to get that spirit of God freedom to work in all areas of your life. And the first thing you got to go after is your emotions, which how many know that's hard? Because your emotions, man, they can lie to you. They can tell you all sorts of stuff that you think is so real. You can wake up one morning and just be certain the world is over. And the world's not over. And you realize that by the end of the day. But your emotions told you it's over, man. And you feel hopeless and you feel discouraged and you feel depressed. And all the, all the while, God is saying, no, I've got a good plan and a future for you. But over here, your body is feeling sick and maybe you feel sick and the allergies have been getting to you. And you, this is my constant battle, the allergies. I wake up in the morning, I'm like, the world's over. No, it's just allergies. And I feel bad and I feel horrible and it affects my emotions. You've also got to let the Spirit of God work in your desires. There's a verse that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You've got all these things you think you really need and you really want. And God's saying, no, here, I know really what you need. I made you. I know what you need. And you want the Spirit of God to start working and changing your desires and then your thoughts too. That's that being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to say, man, I have these thoughts in my mind. I feel this evil and this darkness over me, these dark, evil thoughts. I've got to trust that the spirit of God within me can overpower those things as I feed his work in me. Now, listen to me. There's never going to be more. You're never going to have more of the spirit of God in you than what you have right now because you already have the fullness of what you need. But what you need to do is let his spirit do his work in you. And this is why pastors harp over and over again about this. Read your Bible, pray, go to church. You go, why do they always harp on that? Well, because first of all, you're never going to conquer your thoughts and your desires and your emotions with 25 minutes on a Sunday morning. 
Because as soon as you leave, you're going to go turn on the radio or the podcast or watch the TV and Netflix and all the junk on TV. And it's going to be feeding all these other thoughts that are opposite of what God is saying. And you can have the spirit of God within you, but if you're not letting him have full space to work within you, those other thoughts, those other things are going to conquer out. It's going to end up being two on one. And the spirit of God's strong, but it's us who gives him the liberty to work in our lives. And trust me, ultimately, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. But we can actually speed up the process through something called spiritual disciplines. And I don't have time to talk about all the spiritual disciplines this morning. But spiritual disciplines are things like reading your Bible, praying, solitude. Solitude is getting away from the noise, turning off all the noise and saying, I'm going to sit in my car quietly before work. I'm not going to turn on any music. I'm just going to sit here quietly. And you go, but man, every time I get quiet, it makes me nervous. Because I start thinking about all the bad stuff. And you say, okay, but you know what? I'm going to take those bad thoughts and I'm going to give them to God. And I'm going to let him do some work in me. And you leave room for quiet. You leave room to to read your Bible and pray and spend time with others. And in these spiritual disciplines, I want to recommend two books to you. One of them is called The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. It's a heavy book. It's a slow book. You want to read it slowly. Another one is called The Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Willard. But these disciplines, what they do is they actually kind of, they put a a damper on our, on our, our body and our flesh and they, they help us give, kind of free up room for the spirit to do his work within us. And then that's how we start to see his spirit working in our emotions, our desires, and our thoughts. And this is the question I want you to start to ask now. Whenever you, this week, whenever you go back and you feel that thing coming on, you're like, man, I just feel like I got to take a sip of that or take a shot of that or got to look at this or I feel like I got to say this or maybe I need to protect my reputation over here or do this and by maybe lying a little bit. Ask yourself this when you feel that desire. What's going on in my soul right now? Because that's where the battle's being waged in your thoughts, in your desires, and your emotions. And here's what's really tricky about it. Sometimes we don't even know what's really going on inside our souls. And this is where a verse from Psalm is really helpful. King David, I think this is a verse we should all learn and pray it on a regular basis. King David said this in Psalm 139. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Sometimes we don't even know what's going on in our hearts. We just know we just need this thing. And listen to me. Whenever you feel that need to go do that thing, that habit, that response you always have, in some weird way, you're actually, what you're looking for is God. When you're looking for that looking at that thing you shouldn't look online or looking for something that it's ful- you think it's fulfilling something within you, in a weird way, you're looking for something that only God can fulfill. When you're looking for connection with other people and you're willing to compromise yourself for that connection, what you're looking for is something only God can give. When you're looking for approval from others and you just feel like you're never quite enough, what you're looking for is actually something only God can give you. All of these sins, these things we self-sabotage with, they're actually an attempt to try and meet our needs, but what they do is they undermine us. And this is why it's so important to constantly fight these things because the goal is to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, letting his spirit work from the inside through your emotions, through your desires, through your thoughts, and ultimately into your actions. And here's the really crazy thing about this. When you get serious about engaging in these things and saying, God, show me areas in my life I need to work on. Here's what'll happen. There'll be things you've been trying to beat for years. This is experience in my life. Trying to beat, I've been trying to beat anger, right? And I just clenching my fist. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get, oh, I'm so angry. I'm not, okay, I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get angry. And I can't beat it. But when I'm serious about engaging in these spiritual disciplines and giving the Lord time to work in my life, getting quiet, reading my Bible, praying, spending time in church, spending time with others. Fasting is another discipline that's been tremendously helpful in this area. You'll find one day you just wake up and you realize, I haven't been angry in like three or four weeks. This is crazy. And it wasn't because you had worked so hard at it because you know how hard you've worked to try and beat that and you haven't beat it up to this point. It'll be because God did his work in you and it was all him empowering you to do it. You just gave him room to do his work in your life through disciplining yourself with these spiritual disciplines. And it's an inside out job. Transformation always starts on the inside and works its way out. And that's really good news. 
So my encouragement for you guys this week is, man, when you feel that temptation to go back to that thing that you always do, to soothe yourself or calm yourself or whatever, say, man, what am I really looking for in my soul, God? Search me and know me. Test my anxious thoughts. See if there's any unclean way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And as he leads you in that and you slowly day by day win the victory, you win the victory day by day. It's one day at a time. As you do that, you're going to wake up a few weeks, months from now, and you're going to find that some of those habitual sins that you thought you could never beat, you've conquered. But you stay humble. (laughs) You stay humble and stay connected to God because it's very easy to fall back into them. But this is the work of a lifetime. But you can be confident of this. If you stay focused on this and dedicated to it, man, I'm going to conquer this stuff, not because it makes God more happy with me. I'm going to conquer this because it helps me walk in the glory that God intended for me. When you walk in that, man, I can guarantee you this. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And you will walk in victory, total victory, as you stay humble and walk with him. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that you're the one who gives us the victory over sin. You already conquered it, and now you give us the power to walk in that victory. So I pray for those that, man, they've been dealing with addictions and habits and hangups and pornography addictions and uh, addictions to lying or addictions to all sorts of, maybe it's addictions to shopping, whatever it is, Lord, that they're trying to seek you. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to just begin to reveal to them today what those things are. They can go upstream and see, oh, this is the root of that. This is why I've needed that. But what I really needed was you all along. And as we seek that, Lord, I think you're going to be transforming us from glory to glory. We're going to be closer and closer to your image. If you're here this morning, you have not given your life to Jesus. It's the first step to get your life on on track. Get forgiveness of your sins that only Jesus can give. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean in your heart, God is going to come and forgive your sins, transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up with him in the kingdom of light. He's going to put his spirit actually inside of you. It starts with this prayer. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some stuff to help you along your journey there under the do it again sign back there. You guys, I pray this week that you will walk in victory, conquering those things that are trying to hold you back from the glory God intended for you. You've got this. Walk in victory. Have a great week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.